everyone. Welcome to another one of those random chapters that's not exercise based, but now we're talking more nutrition based. So we're going to go chapter 10 of the essentials for the certified personal trainer for the National Academy of Sports Medicine, aka NASM. All right. So this one here, just going to look a little bit deeper into supplementation. There used to be a thing back I, I want to say maybe I forget when I got my first personal training certification, but they were really adamant about supplementation and not providing guidelines for supplementation. And that has changed. And I think it's the right move um, simply because of the fact that we need to understand that it's part of what we do. I mean, it's a billion dollar per year set of nutritional products. Now are all of them safe? Uh, no. But it's one of those things where that's where we can take it, you know, making sure that we give safe and appropriate guidelines, safe and appropriate options for those who are looking to maintain positive health. All right. So chapter 10, all about that supplementation. Let's get rocking. So what are we talking about? Dietary supplements, right? Anything that is intended to supplement the diet, anything above what your diet is that contains vitamins, minerals, it can contain herbs, um, botanicals, it can be amino acid based or so proteins, it can be anything that is there that is helping to supplement the diet. So if it's not any of those vitamins, minerals, herbs, botanicals, amino acids, anything else, metabolites that are there, concentrations, extracts, all of those things are part of that supplementation. It's our job and actually, it's really the job of everybody to make sure that what we're getting into is safe. But as an exercise specialist, we want to make sure that what we're providing our people with in terms of options, maybe not direct amounts, but options, um, like even a fish oil supplementation. Well, if you don't understand what EPA and DHA are, then you need to make sure you learn that so that you can provide the right options so that they know, okay, the higher the EPA and DHA, the better that quality of that fish oil is in comparison to the total amount. See where we're going is that we have to know what we're looking into. Differences between whey protein. All right, we'll go into that a little bit later. So that's just some of the things we want to understand. So again, it's not main focus of the diet, but really we're talking about it's something that's going to help us. So for example, protein powder is a supplement. And the reason why is because ultimately we could get all of the amount of protein that is recommended for us from all of our meals we eat. But if we just say can't eat that much or we need to supplement with whey protein and have a protein shake, then that's just an example of how we supplement. OK, um, if you're a vegetarian, you know, you might be short on B12. Well, or, or a little bit on iron, maybe you might need, to, maybe the doctor or some, or a dietitian might prescribe you to take another supplement. All right. So we have to make sure that we understand that. So it's very interesting though, that dietary supplements do not require FDA approval. They do not require FDA approval. What they do require is that they are really, well, they don't require it, but they should be third party tested at a minimum. So you know what is in it because, you know, I hate to say it, but you get these athletes who are like, oh, I didn't know what was in my supplement. You know what? Sometimes they're not wrong. Sometimes there are these ingredients that you don't realize if you're just a, a regular person that you don't understand. So we have to be aware of that. FDA does not monitor this. So they don't. That's a good thing and it's a bad thing, but that's just my opinion. That's subjective in nature. So we'll just leave it at that FDA and their controlling mechanisms. Okay. Purity level, I would be okay with, but that's another conversation for another time. So why do we do it? Well, you know, what's the rationale? All right. Well, there's reasons that really they differ because of generational prospects Younger demographics are looking for, like it says here, weight management, body composition, immunity, energy, and then obviously aesthetics. OK, the older demographics are looking to fill in gaps that are caused by missing components or maybe they can't get enough calcium in a day to help with their bones. 
All right, that's just one example, you know, so they have to fill in that gap. If it's a postmenopausal woman, she probably should be supplementing with an, another calcium source, like a, a, just a simple pill, all right? A simple pill that comes from a supplement bottle, all right? So also what can happen is, you know, not even age groups, but just a, a, an ability to, you know, recover faster, right? After an injury, all right, that can occur. It can help with, you know, mental cognition and attention, okay? And it can improve upon performance outcomes, and there's that body comp, okay? So we need to be aware that supplements are good, all right, but they need to be made, you know, especially like it says here, with pregnancy, with health needs, with anything that counteract prescription medications, a physician needs to be involved in that process, okay? So for us, we need to be making sure that we get some sort of order from the physician that would be appropriate, especially for somebody from a special population. So we have to be aware of that. It's going to be the physician that you want to work with. Or if you work with a physician anyway, ask them the, ask them the question about XYZ supplement, and then they can say, no or yes, but then you also need to make sure you know their background, you need to know if they're picking any medications, so on and so forth. Other parts here, provide essential nutrients, and then we have to be very careful about the safety part of everything, not just the safety of the supplement, but the safety of the usage. We talked about counteracting drug interactions, which we don't want, but we also wanna be aware that certain supplements can lead to toxicity, not all of them, but some of them can. A lot of times, in, in most cases, you do excrete them out of your urine or your feces. But for some, we still have to be aware that there is a potential toxicity moment that could occur. So with the guidelines and labels, right? There have been these guidelines that have been given and the FDA is kind of involved with the labeling and you know process but there's like you know there's the regular laws and regulations it's it's very skewed so the fda doesn't have direct effect but they do have to make sure that there's certain things like how it's manufactured it the fda can be part of that how it's labeled the uh, fda labeling is still critical it has to follow those guidelines and then brought to or removed from the market they can still be involved in that with their code of uh, federal regulations. The other aspect, which is the main focal point for supplements, is what we call the DSHEA, all right, DSHEA of 19, uh, 1994, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. And this here is the main legislation that we have that helps us in terms of proper, safe, and appropriate dietary supplements on the market all right so the fda kind of is more of the the backbone behind that in terms of like labeling and manufacturing but it's the deche the deche of 1984 legislation that provides that and i'm trying not to say deche act because basically you're going to say act act all right also, if you're in Europe, if you're in Australia, if you're in Canada, you go by different regulatory processes or uh, committees or different legislation, different parts of the government. In Europe, European Food Safety Authority and the European Union. In Australia, uh, the supplements are, like it says here, they're complementary medicines. So therefore, they're regulated by what they call the Therapeutic Good Administration. And then in Canada, they're regulated by the Food and Drug Act, Food and Drug Act by Health Canada. So different agencies are taking on the responsibility of supplements. But that should be expected. Ultimately, you have to think about it though. If you're taking a supplement, you want to have somebody that's looking it out for you because of the safe and the safeness and the effectiveness of those supplements, right? I forget how long ago it was, maybe uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, roughly. I can't remember exactly when, but there were some whey protein supplements that actually were coming from overseas. And what they were doing was they were finding, after they tested them, that they were finding particles of fiberglass inside of it. 
So it's a filler. I mean, it's definitely not right. That's no different than Subway putting in the same chemicals that help to bind yoga mats and asphalt together. So there's that as well. So, you know, either way, but that's an FDA thing for supplementation. We have to be aware that those things can happen. You don't know what's in a filler unless it's tested. Well, when it was tested, it was reported that it came back with particles of fiberglass, super unhealthy, super unsafe. So we have to make sure that we're getting what we need out of these safe and effective uh, legislations. So for our you know general guidelines, not all of our supplementation is going to create this level of toxicity, but understand that there are some guidelines that are set for how much you should have in a day. If I'm looking at this, I mean, really vitamin D calcium, iron, potassium. Those are some of the ones that I can see being lower the percentage of people who take though, or, or the amount of vitamin D, calcium, iron, potassium in general, those are four that I can think of off the top of my head that most Americans do not get enough of in their diet. So we have to be aware of that. But these are all just levels and what we would call tolerable upper levels, that's the UL, that a person could take unless they want some adverse effects to occur or tolerable upper limits. That's where you know a physician might come in and say they need more than this. But that's not our job as health professionals, as health and exercise professionals, specialists, that we can make that call. So we look at these and be like, okay, we know not to go over this. So if a diet is getting what it needs, I mean, really, is it worth supplementing? That's why in, in my brain, I immediately go to the first thing I think about with, with that is like a multivitamin. Multivitamins contain blatantly obvious, they contain multiple vitamins and minerals that are added into one pill. Well, in some, or some respects, a person, I'll give you an example. My stepfather, um, been dealing with some high blood pressure. So he's been working on some, you know, some things with his health and he takes, um, what is it? A centrum multivitamin silver. And I'm like, what else are you taking besides that? And he labeled off a few other things. I'm like, please stop taking the multivitamin. There's no need for it. And then I'm like, what do you eat in a day on top of that? And he told me, and I'm like, you definitely don't need it with what you're eating. So, you know, a multivitamin, you know, you might end up peeing out more of the vitamins and minerals that are in there because your body isn't going to use them and it's excess. So it's just going to be, you know, filtered through the, the kidneys and then sent out to the, to be excreted. So it's just one of those things where we have to be paying attention to these daily values and these upper limits because going over them, it, it, it's, it's not going to be beneficial. Vitamin C, for example, you know, uh, let's be honest. Well, actually here, I, I'm actually falling in the right category that 2000 milligrams is an upper limit. And it's a, it's basically your tolerable upper limit. Anything over that? I mean, you've heard of doctors prescribing individuals three to 5,000 milligrams or what ends up being three to five grams of vitamin C, you know, when they're sick, mega dosing. That's different because vitamin C is, we'll talk about it in a little bit, a water soluble vitamin. So anything else the body doesn't use, it pees out, right? So that's where we have to be aware of these particulars and which ones are fat, water, B vitamins, which ones, you know, a C vitamin, obviously. So we'll pay attention to that in a little bit. Same thing here. Take a look. There's your B12. B12, sometimes vegans are a little bit low on that. But if you notice, there is no upper limit. All right, there's no tolerable upper limit or upper level. So if that's the case, B vitamins, we know they, like I just said, they get excreted out. Now, minerals, on the other hand, those can get a little tricky because if you go over, it can start causing certain conditions. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we have to pay attention to those, those recommended and those upper limits that we don't want to touch. So be very, very aware of these two, especially because they're more common, this slide and this slide. These are the more common vitamins and minerals that you're going to be working with. 
With responsible use, we're talking a lot about stimulants and creatine as an example. Those are two very, very commonly used aspects. Now, like it says here with stimulants, you walk a fine line between no effects, a positive effect, and an adverse effect. Let's be honest. Have you heard of people that take stimulants uh, in terms of supplementation for pre-workout, for example, and they, you've heard of them dying? Well, yes, not being morbid here, but I just want you to be aware that it's out there. Well, how are they using it? Who gave them recommendations to use it? I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm uh, very, very sensitive to caffeine. So I know, and I actually did an experiment on myself one day and realized that I can take about 1.4 grams of caffeine in before I start to feel sick, which that's 1400 milligrams. I just tried to see how far I could, I know it sounds crazy. I tried as far as I could go before I started to feel that stomach pain. And it was a combination of a lot of things. It wasn't just coffee. It wasn't, you know, I, it was a coffee. It was an energy drink. There was other things that went into it. And so I know you're like, oh, this is crazy. But I wanted to see, because I had a conversation with my students in class one day about the amount of caffeine that you would have to consume to get popped for the NCAA because caffeine is considered a performance enhancing drug at a certain level. And I didn't even make it to, I think, half of what they would consider. So you got to figure consuming that much caffeine and having in your system, it, you're probably going to be nauseous more than anything. All right. So be aware stimulants. You're, you're on us. It's kind of like motivation, right? There's a fine or, or, um, arousal. You get to a certain point where you build yourself up, you get all amped up, ready to go. And if you over arouse, you falter. It's the same thing with a stimulant. You get over the overboard, it'll give you the positive effects until it doesn't. All right. Creatine, on the other hand, it is the number one most studied supplement on the market. I want to say probably by a landslide because it just, for years, it was thought that creatine was going to cause massive health complications. I remember when I, I mean, I remember he, reading in magazines when I was in high school that creatine has the potential to put holes in your stomach. And then that's, that's been disproven. So don't even, don't repeat that, please. But just understand that this is where the myths and misconceptions come into many things. So we want to be aware of that. All right. But <clears throat> what we're saying here is that regulations exist. It's hard to contain them but we want to make sure that we don't abuse. Now, I, I hate to bring these up, but there was a military individual. I remember this story um, very clearly. He was taking a, a stimulant. He was taking, um, I forget the name of it, but it was, it was what was in um, Jack 3D back in the day when that was um, really prevalent. And so he on, you know, he was taking it and he actually took too much of it. And it's really, um, really sad because you're trying to do it for the right reason. Um, but ultimately you're, you're overdoing what really is supposed to be a positive effect. So the, the aspect of it is we have to know what's in it. So Jack 3d had what was called DMAA in it. Um, dimethyl, um, uh, dimethyl amylene, and that was DMAA. Now that's been banned and you really can't, if you find that in supplements, you just be got, you gotta be very careful. Now, typically you can't find them on the general market, but you know, there may be something that's out there that contains it. Just be aware. So you have to be aware that those things can occur. Creatine readily available, multiple different types. Really, honestly, the, the best way that I've seen through research is just the straight uh, cre creatine um, dehyd dehydrase. And that really is, um, it's one of those things where you don't have to go crazy with like these ethyls or um, anything like that. So, and I think I said, I think I said it wrong before, but it's not, 
it's creatine monohydrate. I don't know why I said the previous one, but creatine monohydrate is the normal one. I have that on my shelf. Use it when I want to kind of go through like a, a, a I want to say a growth phase because it does help. Now, there has been some association with bloating and, and other effects like that, but creatine is safe, okay? Very good for helping with lean muscle, but it does help with retaining water, so make sure you're hydrated properly with that. So here's our guidelines. You know, here's some six steps right here. Um, do not, you, I'll, I actually just gonna kind of go through the first couple. Do not use or recommend supplements without first checking labels or reviewing them. Pretty straightforward. Try to avoid exceeding the recommended dosage. Now, that was what I was getting at with that military uh, personnel who, who ended up dying from taking too much of that Jack 3D. I mean, come to find out he had taken multiple scoops of it. And I believe with Jack 3D, you're supposed to start, I remember vaguely, it was like you start with a, a quarter or a half of a scoop, which is very little, and then you build up your tolerance, but do not exceed one, right? Same thing with a monster energy drink. You're really not, I, I believe the label even tells you do not consume more than three of these in a day. So it's giving you the warning right there. Look for supplements with fully disclosed list of active ingredients. Yes. The problem is like it, it gives you the next statement. I'm going to read this even though it's, you know, more avoid pri uh, proprietary blends unless the proprietary blend is listed for you stay away because you don't know what's in it and that becomes a problem especially that's especially for people who are getting drug tested for like a sport um for for performance enhancing drugs it's one of those things where you don't want to get involved with it because you don't they're not showing you what a proprietary blend is and that's where we can get our, ourselves and our people we're working with in trouble do not recommend supplements to those younger than 18 get a physician involved with that uh, different dietary supplements should not be taken together or stacked without reasonable certainty. Yeah, that's that that gets a fine line, but you can check interactions. I don't remember if it was drugs.com where you can go and see interactions of different things. And I think supplements might be on that list as well. So you can always check it. And then those with medical conditions should be weary of dietary supplements, but they should ask before they take. Don't take then ask. Okay. So with the labels, labels look, I mean, really the labels are pretty much what the FDA recommends for all nutritional products. I'm um, pause it here, look at what the requirements are, but there's gonna be some options that you're gonna see. Typically, this is, it doesn't look like this, but these are the values that you're gonna find. Just like a food nutrition label, right? Also, there are gonna be some allergens, you know, may contain peanuts, may contain, uh, Whey, whey protein may contain lactose, blah, blah, blah. So that might be there. You're going to want to keep paying attention to this because you want to see what is there. All right. But the nutrition labels should be giving you some sort of idea. Left-hand side protein powder, right-hand side calcium. You can see it does look like a nutrition label from a food product. And that's correct. It gives you the serving size, how many servings per container, Sometimes you need to, you know, don't trick yourself, pay attention, look, especially with the right hand side. Cause that's a, that's a pill form, a soft gel. So you're like, oh yeah, I'm buying this bottle. It's got 60 soft gels in it or 60 gummies or 60 pills uh, or tablets. Right. But then you're like, oh, that's going to get me through 60 days. Then you realize, oh, I have to take three at a time. Well, you're only getting a 20 day supplement, right? So you need to pay attention to your serving size to know how much you need to buy and is it really worth it? Is there another option that gives the same amount? Um, that, that can be critical. Same thing with your supplements. One of the things that we always wanna pay attention to with our protein supplements, and this goes by quality, is if you look at the amount of the serving size, which is 25 grams, and its protein content is 18 grams, if we took a calculator out, which I'm just going to pull it out right now on my phone here, but 18 grams of protein divided by 25 is 0.72 or 72%. That means that that serving contains about 72% protein. That number, the higher it is to 100%, 
the better quality it is, the more bioavailability there is, the more protein you're going to get, basically more bang for your buck. That's what we're looking for here. <clears throat> if you notice, here we go. This one here has a proprietary blend, but it tells you what it is. Organic pea protein, organic hemp protein, organic goji berry. Well, here's the reason why that is. This is the, exactly what I was just referring to. I said that 18 grams of protein divided by the serving size of 25 grams, which is one scoop, that right there indicates that it's a 72% quality per se. We know based on the nutrition chapter, chapter nine, that protein, when it's an animal based versus a plant based, plant based is not as of a high percentage. Look at the look at the protein proprietary blend is pea protein, veg, vegetable, hemp. That's definitely not meat. Goji berry, definitely not meat. So you're seeing here this is more plant based proteins. Therefore, you're ending up with a lower percentage. Therefore, the bioavailability per scoop is lower. <clears throat> this is just a UK versus a US left hand side, US right hand side, UK. You can see how there's a slight difference in them, but they give a little bit bitter, bigger and better of a profile of what the whole output is of their nutrients meaning the bottom, more of the vitamins and minerals. Here on the left side, they're trying to showcase more of the calcium and vitamin D, so it just depends on what the supplement is that we're looking at. But these are the two, these are two different aspects, all right? We are looking for something that contains a little bit more information, and sometimes the US version doesn't, but it may not always be needed. So with good manufacturing process, we talked about the quality, now we're talking about the manufacturing. Now, if you look here on the right-hand side, it says certifying body, and then it goes back over to the left side as well. Third-party verifications, which are the, which are what we call the certifying body. Now you have what you have informed choice, you have NSF, you have NSF for sport, USP, BSCG, all of those are testing for quality, but only a few of them test for banned substances. So if you're working with an athlete and they're asking you what some good ones to, to get into, definitely make sure that you're looking for those that are late. And usually they have a label on them that states that they're, they're that company, uh, NSF will have a bot on the bottle. It'll say NSF or NSF for sport USP. I know for a fact that USP is on, um, I just bought some fish oil and it's a, it's a, it's a very big tag on there shows it informed choice, very big tag on the label shows it. So you have to just pay attention to those ones, especially if you're working for people who are going to get blood tested, pee tested, whatever, that might be very important for them. All right. And they're there. So, Sometimes you might have to pay a little bit more money, but if you're working with somebody who makes money, number one, let them know you're better off spending a little bit more because you're not going to lose any and you're not going to lose like a contract because you're, you got tested. Or if you're uh, working with college level individuals, same thing, you know, you don't want to lose a scholarship because they're getting popped for, you know, next thing you know, you didn't realize you were, had a constituent of amphetamine inside of it, you know? Health supplements come in a couple different categories, more broad health and performance supplementation or supplements. All right. Among all supplement users, at least 70% are using a multi. Uh, very frustrating to hear, but sometimes it might be needed. I'm just saying in most aspects, we do not need to take a multi. So just be aware that, you know, that might be a thing. Uh, this number increases to 83% between the groups of 18 to 34 year olds. So maybe that's why I'm the way I am because I'm 41, but you get the idea that, you know, it, it just, it, they're prevalent. So maybe save somebody 20 bucks every, every month or so, and, and maybe they don't need to be using it. But again, that's neither here nor there. It's not my choice. It's just, I'm giving you the info for it. 
So yeah, I mean, really your health supplements are more about overall wellness, well-being, where performance is more about getting you to the right performance level, the right body comp, the right weight management, all right? The other thing too, performance supplementation, you might hear also ergogenic aids, legal ergogenic aids, so or non-steroid ergogenic aids, those are gonna be what you're gonna be using for performance bases. Your vitamin and mineral supplementation, this is kind of what I was referring to before. Fat soluble versus water soluble, you know, specific vitamins and minerals that we need to be aware of. Now, fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. I had a student probably about five or six years ago. She was really big about making um, acronyms into words. So attic, you know, she always thought about, you know, I don't want to be in the attic because of the fact that fat soluble vitamins can be toxic at certain levels and no one wants to spend time in an attic, right? So vitamin A, D, E, and K, they all have very good qualities for us in terms of our health, but we don't want to overdo it. Reason why? Fat soluble. They don't break down in water. So basically they're aquaphobic and therefore they do not break down the same way that a water soluble on the next page is all about. So we have to make sure that these are used effectively and safely to avoid toxicity. Water soluble vitamins, there you go. There's your B complexes and your C. You can take these to us, you know, still, you know, vitamin C, you can take vitamin C to a certain level. It can still cause some stomach discomfort, but it's not gonna cause toxicity where you will potentially die, you know, or have some major adverse side effects. So, but again, what did I say before? Vitamin, the B complex and vitamin C, you take too much of it, it's just going to get thrown out into your urine. That's why, again, multivitamins sometimes can be for the birds. There's all of your B vitamins all in one shot. This is, so if you're taking a B complex, this is what you're getting, all right? And this is also what you're, you're going to see as a positive. And there are some that if there, you are deficient in them, it can cause certain effects like uh, pyridoxine, for example, can have a deficiency such as anemia, so low iron, and then dermatitis, meaning you know, there might be some skin condition that you have. B6, again, very prominent in non, non-vegetable, more animal-based products. All right. So just be aware that these are your B-complex vitamins. This is what we, were, when we say. This is our B-complex. This is why. Minerals, there are 16 essential minerals. 14 of them are required on nutrition and supplement labels. Sulfur and fluoride are the only ones that are not there. So if you have a vitamin or mineral present, it must be labeled on the food, on the supplement label to say that. So your your macro or major minerals, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, and chloride, which are really good electrolytes. All right. Um, and also I'm missing one sulfur. Okay. That's, that's another one that you have there, not labeled on the right hand side, but also it's in your little graphic down there. Then on the next one, trace minerals, you have all of the ones in the right hand side. Some of the major, I don't want, I shouldn't say major, some of the more prominent trace minerals, iron, iodine, zinc, chromium, all right, but there's more there. Co- cobalt, molybdenum, manganese. All right, you you know selenium. Selenium is really good for being anti-inflammatory. So there's a lot of positives that come with these. So don't dismiss trace minerals. The bottom line here is, when you take a major mineral, it means that you have to have a little bit more in quantity. There's more of a. I think it's. I think it's hundred. Depending upon the mineral, it's usually going to be a greater than hundred milligrams. Whereas a trace or micro mineral, you're going to, you need usually less than per day, a hundred milligrams. So again, varying amounts, but those are usually distinct limits there. Talked about omega-3 supplements before. If you noticed, um, those, I, I did say those, those terms of EPA and DHA, um, eicosapaton, uh, Eicosapaninoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid, EPA, DHA. Those are your ones that you're going to find in predominantly your predominantly large amounts of omega-3s, particularly fish oils. 
What we want to see is that we have a higher level of EPA and DHA in compared to what the serving size is. So if you see that you are getting a thousand, just say you're getting a thousand milligrams per capsule of fish oil, we would really like to see that above. I mean, I would like to see it above 50, closer to 75% of the fish oil being EPA DHA quality. Doesn't always mean that it's going to be, but if at least you can get to 50% or higher, you're you're doing pretty good. So I take. I think I take 2000 milligrams of fish oil a day. And, you know, there's a lot of really good factors, brain health, cardiovascular health, anti-inflammatory, all those things come into play that help with that. All right. And you're, this is one of the cool things where an omega-3 is a fatty acid, but you will take in fat to help reduce fat, which is even more amazing to me. All right, so the reduction in triglycerides can come from taking in more fat. But appropriate, good omega-3 um, monounsaturated fats. Now, we get into that term ergogenic aids. We said that's more performance-based. If you look on the right-hand side there, that's amino acids. Well, we know that protein supplementation is very big in the world of exercise. So essentials versus non-essentials. All right, we know that there are nine essential, meaning that that's the left-hand side, nine essential amino acids that we must consume because our body doesn't make them. 11 non-essential, which we know because our body does make them. If you look on the left-hand side, the first three have a little bit of a little uh, up arrow, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. If you know anything about branch chain amino acids, those are them. Leucine, isoleucine, valine. Those are what are usually big on helping with muscle protein synthesis. Okay. The thing is, again, supplementation wise, I'm not telling people what to do, but I'm just trying to help you with some insight here. Branch chain amino acids. You see them. You have to eat your food or consume a supplement to make sure you get leucine, isoleucine, and valine on top of the other six. But the key here is that they do sell branched chain amino acids. Most people, if their protein level is high enough, will have that. So consuming a BCAA may not be the best case scenario, maybe a, a, a case where we are wasting money. But again, this is just my opinion. Some people may say otherwise, but that really research doesn't indicate that BCAAs are like going to make or break your performance. There really isn't any indicator that you have to take them for them to be working. And it's only going to make your, your muscle protein synthesis increase exponentially. No, if your diet is high enough in protein and you're consuming protein in the right amount at the right time and the right frequency throughout the day, then you're, you're going to be okay. And you're going to take away that ability for protein to degradate and you're going to be more appropriate in muscle protein increasing or synthesis and rebuilding. Creative supplementation, we talked a little bit about it before, but not only does it help with, you know, our muscle base, our strength, but also it can help with ATP. That's why it's sometimes it was, it used to be, it's come a little bit more alive now, but Creatine has been very important in ATP regeneration because there's more creatine readily available to bond to a phosphorus and then rebuild ADP back into ATP. So that's really important for aerobic exercise so and recovery. So we have to understand that creatine isn't just for the muscle people, you know, and I, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's, it's also for the, the aerobic people, all right? So we need to be aware that it is safe and effective, but it needs to be understood that it can help with the recovery and it can help with prolonging, you know, your endurance. So helping ATP just become resynthesized constantly, having more creatine available, probably not a bad thing. Your body does make it, but... Understand that adding more exogenous outside consuming creatine 
is just it, it is beneficial. There's your stimulants, caffeine in particular. Um, caffeine um, and hydros is pretty much what you might find in a supplement form. Yes, usually what you're gonna find in well, it's changed up a little bit now because a lot of these supplement companies are going to green tea extract because they're saying it's more natural. But caffeine and hydros is, is just as just as natural. Um, but it helps with a lot of factors such as energy and endurance, helps with adrenaline release, it helps with fat burning. Now, there are it says here there are side effects and doses that are greater than 400 milligrams depending upon you. Everybody has a certain tolerance and level, and it might be different for you than it is for me versus the next person. Now, it says here there's an optimal intake of about three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight about an hour prior to exercise. So just say that you're a 100 kilo person that's 220 pounds um, in, in American. So 100 kilos, you're talking about three to 600 milligrams of caffeine an hour before. Well, 600 milligrams can be a lot, but it, it depends on tolerance and how you feel with it. So you have to experiment with it a little bit in that range and you'll, you'll get some of that output performance that you're looking for. Now, there are some ethical and legal, you know, you know, issues that you have here. Efficacy is always one thing. Legal and safe to use, that's another thing. Now, with efficacy, you're going to want to look at, like it says here, research and position papers to, to kind of feel out what that ergogenic aid is all about. Legally and safe, look at the NCAA and WADA, um, the World Anti-Doping Agency. Look at what their, what their banned substances are, and you can kind of get a good idea as to what you might want to have in your own repertoire or what you might you know, think about taking if you really need it. All right. And then obviously contamination purposes, make sure they're verified by uh, third party testing. That's your informed choice. That's your NSF. All right. Look for those label, look for those product labels that have those little um, informed choice or NSF buttons on them. And then with banned substances, there's DMAA. I just talked about that. And ephedra, ephedra is off the market. If products contain ephedra, it's not the ephedra that you're thinking of. It's a different variant of it. So they're trying to market it as a ha have it. But a lot of these that you find on the shelf that say they're ephedra, it's really not the ephedra of old that was getting people sick and potentially dying. All right. But those are banned substances as in stimulants. There's your DMAA. That's, what I, that's the story I was referring to you as. Uh, with uh, referring to with the military personnel who ended up getting, you know, that died because of too much. Then you get into your steroidal ergogenic aids. Now, you know, there are, like it says here, it's a hormone precursor like testosterone, right? What's its job? Its job is to really get more mass, more strength. And you also have the side effects that come with it. Now they are there and they can be potentially life threatening. You're, you know, that, that dispute is going to be ongoing for a long time. Is it that it's causing death in people or is it that there were other factors related to why individuals, you know, are, are, are dying that were known steroid users. So, Personally, like in this, again, this is personal. This is a subjective statement. But if you're taking anabolic steroids, typically the things that your body has in them already just becomes exaggerated. So I hate to say it, but if you're a person who already has acne, it's going to intensify your acne. So just because someone doesn't have acne doesn't mean that, you know, like, oh my God, that person's on steroids because they have acne. Well, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean it. Um, bottom line, I've lost my hair, never taken steroids. But it just, it, it just I feel like it's one of those things where it intensifies what the body is already going to be doing. Now, you know, you can hear about like individuals are like, oh, well, antibiotic steroids cause cancer. 
well, maybe they already had cancer, you know, cancer cells already inside of them that just became exaggerated because of steroids. But again, that is my personal opinion, but just kind of food for thought more than anything. So you, what are you allowed to do? What am I allowed to do? Um, scope of practice is a little bit different um, for me than it would be for you. If you know the education component and the licensures that I have acquired give me a little bit different of a scope of practice. But if you're if you're doing this for the personal training purpose, understand that your scope of practice is dietary supplements and their interaction with medication. You know, so there, you know, what's your expectation? You're providing nutrition and dietary prescriptions. That's beyond. Okay. You, you know, nutritional, well, you can't really, you can't give nutrition plans anyway. You can give nutrition guidelines and advice, but you can't make out a complete nutrition plan for somebody. Same thing with dietary supplements. You can offer up your information and knowledge, but you cannot say you should be taking it this, this time of the day at this amount this many times per week, blah, blah, blah. All right. So at that case, qualified healthcare professionals, registered dietitians, always a good way to start versus having to always go to the doctor. All right. There's that general advice I was talking about. And there's that avoidance, avoidance of meal plans, nutritional therapy, definitely a no, no, and avoid, um, you know, giving out plans for dietary supplements, but you can give out general advice about what you take or what you know athletes have taken. So, you know, it, it, you're not crossing over boundaries at that point, but it's a very fine line. So just be aware so you don't get yourself into any sort of trouble. So all the way back to the beginning here, supplements. They're a wacky, crazy group of things that you can go through and take but be careful on what you're going with, you know, always research before doing. And that's with a lot of things in life, but understand that this one here with supplements, it can, it can be a health hazard if not taken seriously. So thank you for listening to this. I know that there was a lot of added information, but I think that this helps with you to understand and make it go a long way for not just your people, but also for yourself and trying to be safe and effective. All right. So chapter 10, all done. Couple things, a couple housekeeping things. If you're listening to the end here, set it in my, these are some of my newer chapters that I'm doing. So kind of offering it up out there to people that there are, um, for a monetary fee, I'm, I'm offering up all of these PowerPoint slides you see in all these videos for each chapter so that you can also have them to go over while you're studying yourself, while you're going through the book to make notes on. So please feel free to reach out to me. Also, um, follow me on Instagram or, or uh, Facebook. Don't hesitate. Uh, that could be a good place to ask questions if you want. And also, I am going to be starting, and I'm going to create another video for this, but I'm creating a Facebook group that can. it's more for certification preparation for you all to ask questions and have answers to specific parts of the certification that maybe come from not just me or other professionals, but also come from your peers. Okay. So thank you again for listening. Check out all the, the other issue, the other information that I provided and obviously look at the other videos that are out there too. So have a great day and good luck with your studies.